In order to build something really magical, it requires that you be your best self. Yeah. And for me, my best self is committed to social change. It's committed to changing institutions. And I knew I couldn't be just selling products. Yeah. It would never be my jam. If you believe we can change the narrative, if you believe we can change our communities, if you believe we can change the outcome, then we can change the world. I'm Rob Richardson. Welcome to Disruption Now. Welcome, everybody. Uh, Rob Richardson here, Disruption Now. It's great to uh, have the listeners. So everybody uh, listening, please, uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, like. If you're on if you're on Apple Podcasts, please give us a review. Uh, we're always happy to have your support. With me today is, uh, is a kindred spirit that I didn't know was a kindred spirit, uh, but I've looked at her background and, uh, I mean, she's, she's, she's a, t- a twin of mine in a lot of ways. Um, uh, so Phaedra, Phaedra Ellis Lampkins has been uh, really about impact and power for a long time. She has background in the labor movement. She has background in fighting for criminal justice reform. Uh, and she's taken a lot of her knowledge and is applying that to doing good in the world and using the power of entrepreneurship and the power of tech for good. Uh, a lot of times when people think about it, they think about it only in terms of uh, how can how can people make the most money uh, in the most in the fastest and most efficient way without worrying about the consequences. And what I appreciate about Phaedra's approach, specifically with our company Promise, is that its whole goal is tied to uh, having impact and, and, and understanding that you can both have impact and have profits. The two don't have to be mutually exclusive, nor should they be. And, and, and figuring out how we can use the power of technology uh, to help those who often are overlooked with the technology in terms of the technology revolution and where we're going in this world. So it's my honor and privilege to have her on. Phaedra, how you doing? Good. I'm so happy to be here. And I'm so excited to hear more about your background. And it does feel like we're kindred spirits. It really does. Like you, So you started in the labor movement. As I, yeah. I told you, I'm a member of the Labor's International Union. My mm-hmm. father, uh, a lot of the reason why I'm standing here is because of, uh, of what he was able to do. So uh, he, he started off as a, as a laborer uh, mm-hmm. and worked his way up as business manager and everything else. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And, and eventually he's a, he's a regional manager and vice president. But I tell people this story often that, you know, a building he literally helped build, he had to drop out of engineering uh, to mm-hmm. help provide for uh, it was my it was my sister. It wasn't my fault for this one, but it was my sister. <laughs> he had to find uh, a way to provide, so he had to get a job, and he became mm-hmm. a laborer. And then he um, uh, he became a laborer, and actually, the building he worked on, it, even though he couldn't become a he didn't become an electrical engineer, he could have. He just couldn't at that time. I ended up graduating electrical engineering, and, and my and my picture literally hangs in a in a building he literally helped build with his hands. So, oh wow, what a great story! Yeah, so it's been. A part of my mission, and I've done a lot with community organizing, and I want to talk there because uh, I know you have a lot of background specifically with working with labor. Mm-hmm. And if I remember correctly, figuring out how to work with labor and and and, and getting jobs that are environmentally sustainable, because that's mm-hmm. been that, that is continues to be and is a really big issue. Uh, talk about your background there and how that's informed what you're doing to this mm-hmm. point right now. Mm hmm. Yeah, I um, one I always love hearing people's stories, so I really appreciate you sharing. Um, I started in the labor movement pretty young. Um, uh, the labor movement was transformative for me. My mom was a waitress at a place called Bill's Place in San Francisco. Okay, and uh, she went back to school and got a union job. And there was uh, I like you know how you have life moments that shift. And for me, the day my mom got the call. And she was like, I think it was like 10 or $12. And it was like, you're going to make, and she was like, what will I do with all that money? And so it was like, I went from free lunch to reduce lunch, which was a big deal in my life right. uh, in terms of where you stand up to sign up for lunch. Um, and so for me, my mom getting a union job was transformative. We didn't use Medi-Cal stickers anymore. I had to pay for lunch. It just like, it created a sense of dignity that I didn't know I was not being given until I got it. And so I just thought, when you have that shift in your own life, you want that for other people. And for me, I was really moved, especially by children. And I just thought, how can we as a society be in a place where kids live without dignity or treated differently? And um, and so that's why I was really drawn to the labor movement. So I went in as an intern. Um, originally, I was like, I'm going to be a civil rights lawyer. And, uh, and then just discovered um, how powerful it was that working people could control their own destiny and uh, the power of collective bargaining. And so I was in the labor movement for 13 years um, and it shaped who I am, it shaped how I think about the world um, and just with some of the most incredible member leaders that I feel very lucky to have worked with. 
Yeah, I, I, I really believe that if more corporate leaders, people on boards had the background of understanding working people, being in organized labor, being on the ground, we'd have different policies. We have people making totally. that, you know, you can say something is nefarious intent. I don't necessarily think that's it all the time. It's people that just don't even have any understanding of the other perspectives. So they make decisions and they're not proximate to the to the people that are being affected by those decisions. So I completely agree. And it's a very inspiring story. Um, I really want to talk about, uh, I want to stay a little bit on this point. I do know there are also little challenges within the labor movement in, in, in terms of interacting yeah. and working with the community. We can be really, uh, I'm very frank about this because I, I, I work uh, in the building trades in terms of, and we're with the labor, so we, we tend to be a lot more progressive and inclusive. Uh, but there are some issues there in terms of how people view, uh, you know, how labor, how the, how the labor movement uh, needs to be more connected sometimes to the community and, and the people that it serves. Can you talk about any challenges that you may have had or where you see as opportunities now that we can, uh, that we should be bridging the gap and doing a better job of? Yeah. Um, well, one thing, uh, being a black young woman in the labor movement, yes. leading a labor federation was its own experience. Oh, please tell. <laughs> it's like <laughs> I was 27 years old and wow. was running a local labor federation and um uh, it was, uh, to say, and I, we were really progressive. Right. And right. so the first thing you don't normally see a black <laughs> progressive running a labor organization. It's that right. no, you looked in the room, people like, right. what, what, <laughs> what, 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 what's going on here. And, and at the time there was a separation in the labor movement and SEIU and some of the uh, very progressive unions were yeah. potentially leaving the labor federation. And so I was this new labor leader who was like, we should be more progressive. We shouldn't work with just the AFL-CIO. And I ran the AFL-CIO local federation. And <laughs> we should. Uh, so it was it was somewhat, uh, I think it's probably the only time I've been called girl. Like uh, someone said, you were, I was shucking and jiving. And so it was uh, a really fascinating experience. Um and, but the thing that was always compelling to me is, is that the power of the labor movement is like in the moms who are janitors, who work two jobs, who are tra- living in garages, making a better life for their families. And so for me, that was always the center of the labor movement. I was always shocked when I dealt with the national leadership because it was just like a culture shock because it's like leaving home because yeah. in the local movement, I felt so supported and nurtured and the, had a real clarity of vision. Um, you know, speaking of uh, building trades, I was once at a rally and I was speaking in Spanish and this like uh, camera person screamed, speak in English, speak in English. And I see like the carpenters just zoom, like, and it was just like, I felt so like such solidarity. And so, yeah. um, so one thing I think that's really important about the labor movement is you have to measure success because people are paying for your salary. And so what I appreciated about the labor movement is that, but it also made it hard to your point to think about community interactions because sometimes I would be working with community groups who I had the highest level of respect for, but they didn't have members who were like, deliver this by this date. So I remember someone saying like, we should lose this because it doesn't feel right. And I was like, uh, my members aren't going to be like, I should lose this because it doesn't feel right. They're going to be like, go get, we need health care and benefits. Mm-hmm. And this is not a moral victory that there are moral victories to be had, but you don't have the moral victory at the expense of someone else's family. And so. Yeah. Yep. That's, uh, the only the cha- yep. That's the challenge. I think it's a. Uh, you, you stated it very well. I think it's a two-sided challenge. It's the challenge mm-hmm. of, okay, so you, you, you have, People that are like, okay, we have to just do this because this is something we have to do right now. Right. No matter the consequences, do it. And then you have the other side, though, that I think is the challenge for when you have some power. And when you're in mm-hmm. the leadership structure of, uh, of a labor movement, you may not have as much power as corporations, but you have some power. You can't, uh, you can't also just be internally focused because we have to, I think, continually be outwardly focused to show value to working people. Yeah. Because if they, because if people don't support the labor movement, it's going to hurt them, but it'll hurt everybody. But we have to be, we have to go out there and continually, I think, uh, be more externally focused, even if we don't get a direct transactional benefit. Uh, totally. Because eventually that pays off. It's the first the right thing to do. But also, if you don't have people behind you, that's how no rights at work is not right to work. How those, how those terrible labor laws pass because people are fooled or they just don't hear from unions enough. So uh, I do think the work that you did uh, and continue to do in another way is very, very important. Uh, Prince, I want to talk about, you have a background with Prince, which is just so fascinating to me. Yeah. <laughs> you, you helped 
actually Prince get ownership of his catalog, which I have a lot of uh, interest in hearing you know, and a lot of really, um, it, it's personal to me because as, I, as we talked offline and we're launching a platform that's about empowering artists, I would love okay. to hear love to hear the story about uh, working with Prince. Specifically, what's the most important thing or lesson or conversation you took away from Prince? Yeah, um, so there's no one like him ever has been, I think, and ever will be. The level of genius is just remarkable. Um, my job was really difficult with him because uh, I had, uh, he used to call me um, Merriweather, wait, Mayweather, Floyd May, like Mayweather, because okay. there had been some stuff and my job was to kind of go be the mean one and be like, no, you can't do this and you can't do this. And uh, and so the lesson that he uh, told me that has been one that I hold forever was, you know, I came to him and I was like, oh gosh, this person doesn't like me. And I, and I'm doing all this, you know, he, he, you know, he would be like, he would always be the kind one. Right. And he'd be like, okay, now go do this. And I'd be like, okay, oh, okay, go. And I'd go do it. I'd be like, oh, my heart hurts. I want people to like me. And, and he was like, you don't need to be liked. And I was like, I do. I really, really do. Um, and uh, he said to me something that was really, um, he, he actually told me his, one thing he said, he said, as long as they like me, it's fine. They don't need to like you. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, what? I was like, oh, he's like, it's not your job to be like, um, the thing he said that, that has always uh, stood with me is that he said, you have to decide Phaedra, if you are going to play in the big leagues or the small leagues. And he mm -hmm. said, because if you play in your backyard, no one boos you. When you play in Madison square garden, you're going to get booed. So if you want to play, you need to get ready and you need to get used to booze. Otherwise you just should stay in your backyard. Wow. And I just was like, it was like a gut check. It was like, get yourself together. This is not the place. And I just was like, yeah, if I, I want to make big change, I got to be in the big leagues, which means I can't be worried about whether, as long as what I'm doing is clear and my purpose is clear and he and I were aligned, then I couldn't be worried if people thought I was mean or didn't like me. And, and that was a really important learning lesson for me. Wow. That is a, that is a powerful lesson. Right. Uh, uh, I, I've seen some uh, uh, clips of Prince recently and had no idea his level of like philosophical intellect, uh, like things like that. Like you wouldn't, people wouldn't know. And I really think maybe we should make this part of disrupt art. People need to understand the other side of him outside of music. They need to understand. Cause I don't, I didn't understand. Like this, this brother was deep, deep. deep. He would send me YouTube clicks, clips and he would just be like, uh, the the funniest but also the worst is when he would call me be like, like 2 a.m. and I'd be like, uh oh, he just got something he read, something he wants to talk about. And I would just be like, uh oh, this is going to be a really important lesson. But uh, yeah, he, he was literally the most brilliant human I've ever met and um, just committed both to faith and learning. And it's interesting because I hadn't been a fan of his music. Um, until of course you work with him and hear it and you just can't there, like he's destroyed all music for me. Um, uh, but it's just, he as a human was incredibly remarkable. And I hope the world remembers him for his commitment to, um, the liberation of black people, to social justice, to, uh, everything he did was really about liberation. Yeah. And I don't think people know that, like, I didn't know that. And the fact is, you know, what, what this show is about, what I'm, what I'm about in general is about, uh, you know, changing common narratives and constructs uh, and, and challenging them. And I, I didn't tell you this story about me. All my listeners know the story, but I'll be very brief when I when I say it and why it's important to me is because, you know, I, I have ADHD, not that that matters. Mm -hmm. but when mm -hmm. I was growing up, uh, they viewed it as a, they, they viewed it as a learning difference now, but they called it learning mm -hmm. ability then. So something mm -hmm. was wrong with you, right? If you weren't uh, mm -hmm. learning the way everyone else learned and, uh, you know, but luckily I didn't accept that as a label for life in the eighth, in the eighth grade. I told my teacher all of my dreams and aspirations and Pedro, she essentially said, like, you're not going to be able to do that. Look mm -hmm. at how you're not going to college. Look at, look at your academic record. Like you need to be mm -hmm. more realistic in your assessment. And, uh, my mother gave me words that stick with me to this day. She said, look, uh, you never have to be defined by anyone's low or narrow expectations of you mm. for yourself, by yourself. Mm, that's such good. Never be defined. That's right. That's right. So I, I haven't been, but my goal is to make sure others aren't either. And uh, that we destroy these narratives and these constructs that are put forward. It, that If you're a black man, you are only this. If you've done this, you're only this, or you can only be this because you're from a certain area. Like, so my mission in life is to do that. So that's the reason why uh, I think it's so important for people to know the full scope of 
who Prince was. He was more than a, he was a lot more than an entertainer. That's what he did. That wasn't his mission in life mm-hmm. it's about empowerment. Like you said, uh, let's talk about a little bit with, with your work with, with Van Jones. We talked a little bit about it, uh, but you've done some work mm-hmm. uh, with uh, the, you were the CEO for green for all. What was, mm-hmm. What do you see still as the biggest opportunity and challenge when it comes to climate change at this moment? Yeah. Well, one, you could just appreciate the culture shock of going from running a labor federation to going to green for all. I was like, I went there and I was like, how do we measure success? What are the, you know, like, and I was like, oh, Lordy. And, and coming after Van, who Van, who is like, the most, I remember the first meeting, like we start every meeting with a song and I was like, okay, cool. And then I was what? like, wait, 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 what? Rewind that. So at a van meeting, he starts every meeting with a song? Well, yeah, cause it was like very soulful, artist driven. Um, it was just, it was introspective. And it, this was like, you know, a hundred years ago. And so I had come, the only place I'd ever worked was the labor movement. This wasn't a hundred so, years ago. Was the green for all? I mean, it was like, what, 10 years ago? I mean, it was 12 saying, years ago. We're saying, we're saying we're saying that's 100 years ago, guys. Okay, no, I know. Wait, wait, I know. Wait, wait, <laughs> yeah, wait, I know. <laughs> Before Obama. So we've had three different, we've had three presidents since I was oh, there. Okay, yeah, all right. So yeah. it feels yeah. like, feels like pre-Obama is like another generation. Yeah. Um, and so, so the difference was they were like more community or not, it wasn't even community oriented, but it was much more like, I never, no one ever cared about how we felt as individuals when I was in the labor movement. It was like, it wasn't a, it was about the outcome, the measurement. It was about, you know, like success was not measured about how we felt. Success was, did people's wages improve? Did power get, you know, like, did you increase power? Like it was very clear. So to be in a place with that, a different level of like, it's about our personal experience. It's about that for me was just like, I was like, what are you guys talking about? Um, so it was it was amazing. Um, uh, the biggest threat, I think, to climate change, my biggest fear is that people do not believe it's real in the midst mm-hmm. of a global crisis. Yeah. And um, that as, you know, I'm in California and we're having fires and, and even hearing people say like global warming, they think it's about heat, right? They don't see the loss of of the oceans or flooding or looking at what happened in the East Coast and in Texas yeah. and and that it is most likely to be poor black and brown people that are impacted. And so, and and the part I think that's hard is it's like the reason that people don't talk about the narrative is because the people who are most likely to be impacted are the poorest among us. Yeah. And it's our folks. And so we have to say, you know, this is real, but that if this were happening to people in Manhattan on Park Place, like this would be a national crisis. It's all people would talk about. And so that's what scares me about global warming is that it, the impact in the Gulf Coast, the impact is uh, is so um, clear for all of our folks and that we aren't talking about it in that way is, is very problematic. And that's why, you know, infrastructure investments are gonna be really incredibly important. Yeah. But, I, you know, I think we should we have to make sure to not talk about it as some crazy environmental thing, but it's something. Yeah, that, I think that's the. <laughs> so if I get to it, like, I think the yeah. issue is also it. I agree with you. I think there's several levels of issues and, and reasons we, we we face a challenge. There is the and, and it's a hard. First of all, it's a, it's a wicked structural hard okay. problem that's been okay. ingrained. So and so like it's been so we got to go up against a, a system that's been in place. So that that's not easy. But beyond that, the messaging has been very poor. I think it's been extremely yeah. poor. People, when they tend to think of uh, cl- uh, climate change activists, they tend to think of one of two uh, areas that don't see one or two, I think, pictures that aren't aligned with reality of who's being affected. I think they think of tree huggers. People are like up against a tree, hippies, so on and so forth. And I'm being, I'm making generalizations. This is not accurate, but I think, I, I think if you, if the average person, if they're being honest, what they think, or they think of people, this is an elitist problem that they get to deal with, so on and so forth. And it's been, uh, and, and it's been the challenge is people, it hasn't been described in terms of how it affects black and brown people. The people leading these organizations tend to not be people of color, tend to be not people that understand or connected to these problems. So if you're trying to, uh, uh, if you're trying to articulate a vision for a problem that you're not all the way connected to, it becomes, you, you, there, there's a true disconnect. So, uh, and then three, I think it's a challenge that it's something that even though people see these things happening all the time, until it actually happens to them, it's harder. So it's just kind of, 
it's a, it's a problem that gets worse in the future and it continues to get worse, but people are focused on their problems right now and don't see the connection sometimes. So that's my back of the napkin assessment. I can be completely off, but that's what, that's what I, that, that's what I address, uh, assess of the situation. No, I think that's right. Yep. I think that's right. Uh, okay. So, uh, so let's talk about your work with uh, what you're doing now, because you've, uh, it's been very impressive as a CEO of, of Promise. You just recently closed a Series A round of, I think, over $20 million. I think before that, you raised millions of dollars. Uh, it's been very, very, very impressive. Let's let's talk about how you stay principled, though, because I, I, I've read some of your interviews, and you've mm-hmm. you've made a point of building a uh, building a sustainable, profitable business mm-hmm. that is still focused on a mission that that, mm-hmm. that aligns with everything that you've been working towards your entire life. Mm -hmm. That sounds Um, good in in theory. How do you do that though? Like, it seems like it's hard. It's so hard. I wish it, I wish I could be like, and now we're done. Uh, The biggest challenge is there's not a lot of models for companies that are building capital businesses that are not extractive. And so like when I was like, we want to build a business that doesn't harm people. The model I would hear is Ben and Jerry's and yogurt, right? It would be like, oh, these are the two companies that have managed to not harm people. And I just was like, there has to be a better model than, than the ice cream and yogurt. Right. Um, and so, so uh, the work we do, we started really focused on the criminal justice system. And um, what we discovered is that the system is uh, any efficiency you create for the system is problematic, even if you're doing good because the system is so um, mm. either broken or working. To, Wait, back that up. Design. Any yeah. efficiency you create is still problematic because the system is, is corrupt. Is, right, but you just can't. Cause like originally when I was like, it's like, oh, we're gonna make the system better because, and what I realized is the, the consequence of that is let's say we made it better on the beginning. They figure out how to do harm somewhere. Like we created 20% more capacity to do yeah. more harm. So even yeah. though our system was efficient, it created more harm, you know, like it allowed the system to do more harm. Yeah. And so we just made a decision that wasn't for us, right? We couldn't do that. So back up, let's talk more about what, and and because we, we break this down to several layers about the criminal justice reform, what moved yeah. you I want to talk about that. Let's let's take high level picture first. What does sure. promise do? And let so people get an understanding of what your business does. And then we'll talk about what motivated yeah. you to come up with the idea specifically in the criminal justice system and what problems you see there and how you want to solve them. So let's go big picture there. Yeah. Promise you started off being this. What what what, what was it? So uh, promise uh, we work with government because we believe that government is an institution that's important for the people that we grew up with and the people that we care about. And so when we first started Promise, we were very focused on the criminal justice system. We were trying to figure out how to scale bail reform. Yes. Two thirds of the people that are incarcerated in jails are there uh, before they've been convicted of the crime. So they've been charged, but not convicted. And it's a lot of people with nonviolent offenses who are there because they can't afford to get out. So if you think the system is broken, we wanted to think through how could you use technology to be able to get people out more quickly or not have people incarcerated at all because they have not been charged with, a, they have not been convicted of a crime. And so the idea that we incarcerate people because they're poor is unacceptable. And the idea that we incarcerate people before they've been convicted, right? Because this isn't a risk thing, right? This isn't like you've, this isn't someone who's murdered someone or done anything. This is really just a, and because we know the system's so broken for poor black and brown people, right? You're more likely to be stopped. You're more likely to be arrested. And so if you're looking at a broken system. And so originally what we thought is we're going to work to understand risk and to be able to make the case and provide software so that people can go home instead of being incarcerated. Okay. And we had some success. It seems, it seems that seems. Yeah, okay. it was good. We had some success. But then I was sitting in Alabama in a meeting with some folks. And I literally, two things happened to me. One, I was at a conference and then this, these folks started telling homophobic jokes. And this was like the head of a statewide system with the, the head of a company. And I just was like, this is like how they talk when I'm here. Lord knows what, how they talk when I'm not here. Yeah, how they talk and, about you. Right, and, 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 <laughs> I guess they think they can be homophobic since I'm black, you know, like it, it's like, this is our good level of discrimination. So I just was like, and you know, I can't control myself in those kind of situations. So I was just like, this is unacceptable. You're like me. Right. I was like, what the, what's wrong with you? And my poor co-founder was like, oh Lordy, here she go. I was just like, what's wrong with you guys? So I was like, oh, not gonna be able to sell to those people. Yeah. So then I was in the South 
in a meeting and literally the people were talking about keeping someone in jail for a pretrial arrest for seven years on a marijuana arrest. And I just was like, I felt like I was in a movie. It was just like, do you remember the Dukes of Hazard where the sheriff is just yeah, I remember, I, I, right? Do you remember Boss Hog? Hog? I, I, I just and I just literally I was with a colleague. I just got up and I just left and I didn't go back. I just was like, I don't have anything productive. And so I just and at the time Trump was president, and we were talking to the federal system, and I just was like, anything we do for these folks, even if our intent is good, even if our yeah. software is good, the consequences of our work will be harmful. Yeah, wow. Because wow. the system will get better. So literally I called one of our investors, our biggest investor, and I was like, so I'm not gonna do this anymore. <laughs> it's like, it's like, cause I just felt like in order to build something really magical, it requires that you be your best self. Yeah. And for me, my best self is committed to social change. It's committed to changing institutions. And I knew I couldn't be just selling products yeah. It would never be my jam. Like it just, yeah. it, it, it wouldn't be, I, I couldn't this, do it. You and I have that in common. Uh, I think you, you quoted as saying good software in the hands of the wrong people can do bad, can do damage. Which right, is, does, right. Yeah, it's so just, just does, right. It does bad. And even if I had good intentions. And so I just was like, we're not going to do this. And so I was like, I'll return all this money. And, um, and then what I was wow. uh, uh, struck by is the, and our investors like, no, we believe in you keep the money. And I was like, okay. And, um, I'd been in that same trip. We'd been to New Orleans and I'd seen um, they people were in jail for parking tickets. Yep. And I just was like, you know, this must be New Orleans, but it's much better in California. And I went to California and said, what happens in Oakland at the time? It's since changed. I said, what happens if you get a parking ticket? And they said, well, you need, if you can't afford a parking ticket, one, you have to wait until it's at least $500. So what that means is you have to wait until you have fees and fines you can't, you don't owe the original ticket probably. So it's like, if you're too poor to pay originally, you have to wait until it's more expensive because you couldn't pay it to put it on a payment plan. Mm -hmm. And then you have to pay 50% down and you have to prove you're poor to pay them to put it on a payment plan. And you have to come to their office with your taxes. And so just like, if I want to buy a Peloton interest-free for six months, I have to answer like three or four questions. But if I'm poor and I can't afford a ticket that the consequence is jail, they make it as difficult as possible. So yeah. I just was like, this is unacceptable. And so that's how we ended up in the payment space is at the time the government wouldn't work with us. And so we just scraped their system and we just started paying people's tickets. And like only through the grace of God and people's spirit, 93% of people paid us back. We didn't even have their address. Wow. And so, right? Wow. It's just wow. Wait, back up. Let me just try to understand what you just said. So, you you essentially just paid people's bills and hope they would pay you back. You didn't even have their information at first. And no, all we have percent of over ninety three percent paid back. I mean, that is first of all, what a leap of faith. So, uh, and 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 it's and it's awesome that they did, and it, and it shows you that you can have. That's very scary, by the way. So, you really took a leap of faith. We took on a principle. total leap of faith, and and and. And people, and I would just like, I remember one time this guy didn't pay us back and we were like, we don't even know where he lives. So like, what could, we had no recourse. We could send a text message, excuse me, you, you didn't pay us back. Was there anything we, in particular that you guys did? Like, what, what do you think made you successful in people saying, I want to pay you back? I think what we did is we sent reminders to people about um, their bills. We, um, I think it is silly as it sounds, all of our systems are built as though people want to pay. So mm -hmm. when people don't pay, we don't presume that the thing to do is to be punitive. Right. And so right now payment systems are really built for people who have money. So it's like you pay on this day once a month. And if you don't pay, you fail in government. But the reality is of like a lot of people I know is, you don't just because I have money on the 12th doesn't mean I have money on the 12th again next month. Right. might have money, you know, on the, on a different date. And so, so our systems are just designed. So like, for example, if someone misses a payment and they make it within two weeks, we don't have late fees. We don't have, you know, like, it's just like, because the thing we know is when we run someone's credit card and it fails, a majority of the time it's insufficient funds. So right. what do we look like trying to threaten people? Like, it's like exactly. you don't have money. It's like, so the payment system, if we want people to pay, we should just recognize it's not that they don't want to pay, it's they literally don't have money. And so right. you just act with grace. 
So the business model sounds like, because I'm trying to figure out how, how one makes money. It, yes. Like it's, so you work with governments who are very, who have a poor return of getting yes. the money in the first place and using your process to get the money, but they, they pay you for it because they get less, they're not going to get the money anyway, but you're doing it in a, in a more effective way, essentially. Exactly. The, and, and to be really specific, you and I were talking about uh, Tony Parrott, who was one of our, is a client in Louisville who runs the Louisville uh, water uh, sewage is uh, in a place like that because of COVID, there were thousands of people who were not paying their bills um, because they were unable to because they'd lost work. So one thing you could do is just shut off everyone's water. And in a lot of places, there's so many people that would have had to been shut off. It would have taken years to actually shut off everyone's water. Right. And so instead what they do is what normally you would do is shut off people's water and then you would turn them into collections. And for government, you get uh, much less money when they go to collections. And um, so what we say instead is we will work with someone to get the money paid back, um, but we want to keep their water on. We don't want someone's water to be shut off. And we're going to give them basically the term. So instead of saying like uh, you have a six month, like we think of it as you have a six month term instead of just like this day, this day, this day. And then and in Louisville, there was a case study. And again, 93% of people paid it back. And so it's such a better value proposition for the government of Louisville to be able to say, we're going to get 93% of this money back. We're going to keep people's water on. And it's so much more inexpensive than collections. And so it tends to be a win-win because the person gets to keep the uh, resource um, we think we're going to root for them. We're going to take cash at Venmo. Any way you can pay, we're going to make right, it work. Right. And so, so anyway, that's the, that is because you either would get, you know, uh, for uh, collections, they sometimes take up to 60% of the money they collect and they collect at very low rates. Wow. Wow. So their, their greed actually keeps them from making more money. Uh, that, that's interesting. It's an interesting model. You're just really taking the whole concept and just really turning it on its head. Um You've had success fundraising. I want to go back to that as a as a black woman. I, yeah. I, I, really, I really hate kind of talking about these things as first. You're the first black woman to do this and that because it's like, a, but but the 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 statement is though you still have had a lot of success, um, and we still have barriers. And I and I know you understand that a lot of it has to do with opportunity and timing. And you're also brilliant, but all those things come together. Mm, thank at you. I, I know you understand that. And that's the reason why I'm, I'm like hesitant to say the first black woman, this and that, but you've had success traditionally where others have not. Mm -hmm. What lessons do you think we, what lessons would you, do, would you like to share with the audience in terms of how they should be thinking about it? I, I like to learn it for myself as I have a startup I'm working on now. Like what is, okay. what's the best approach here when you're first starting off? Uh, even if you have some initial capital, what's the best approach to think about fundraising uh, to have success? I just realized we've raised like over 50 million. Just as yes. you're sitting here, I'm like adding it up. I was like, man, we raised 50 so you, million. You have all, so you're, 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 you have, you're very much an expert in this area. So I'm all ears and I will Yeah, we definitely, we raised. Um, uh, one is, I think, uh, one is we should just acknowledge that venture capital is racist. So like we should, we should not pretend because I think uh, I have been lucky in some places that we should like, so if it doesn't happen for people, it's not, it's not because it's a skill, the system is structurally broken. So we should just acknowledge that. Right. Um, I um, was really lucky when I left working for Prince, what I was struck by is that uh, the technology was not working for artists and especially legacy artists of color because the uh, technology was devaluing content, meaning that people yeah. were making less. And so I was like, wait, technology isn't good for the environment. It isn't good for the labor movement. It isn't good for artists. So I was like, we should understand this. So I went to work at a company called Honor, which I'm on the board of now. And um, Honor uh, did home care, which was perfect. I'd been an SEIU organizer in IHSS and in home support services. So I was like really excited to do that. Um, and I went there to run operations, but I actually ended up running revenue. And, um, and so I was lucky when I went to raise, I had um, been in a company and been responsible for making money yeah. at a company that was doing well, right? That had raised hundreds of millions, you know, I don't know, it's maybe raised a hundred or 200, more than a hundred, couple hundred million dollars. And so to be able to have that type of experience and Mark Andreessen was the largest investor from a firm called Andreessen Horowitz. And so yeah. it was just like, I didn't know anything about tech. It just happened to be the company I went to work at, had a good investor, and then I ran revenue. And so- but I think that's uh, a really important point and I want you to continue. Yeah. Because people get into entrepreneurship 
And, and there's this myth that's like, oh, the best way to be successful as an entrepreneur is you have to go out there first, risk it all. And what you're showing is that actually uh, a better path, and I've heard this more and more, is to actually have some experience, maybe even as a regular job in the corporate sector and other, and leverage that experience versus trying to have to learn everything on the fly as an entrepreneur. Oh, so yeah. I'm, I'm pulling that lesson as one that I think we that people need to listen to because there has been this illusion online that the best way to make it is just to go out there, risk everything, and you have to be willing to take the risk. And if you have a job, then you don't know what it means to be an entrepreneur. I mean, it's 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 it's. I, I think we've. It's over, like over rich run. young people say stuff like that. It's like, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know where people live, but like someone else wasn't going to pay for my kids to go to school. So like, if I didn't have a job, there was no. I, I didn't. I know people are like, why didn't you go to business school? And I was like, business school, like who's going to pay my mortgage? Like, what do you, and I hear people, I had student loans. I was like, I didn't have parents that, you know, paid for anything. My, you know, like I just sent money home. Right. <laughs> you know, like, so it just doesn't, I, when I supposed hear the that, model like being broken, cause the model is you're supposed to be able to come out here and take all risk. And that's what Mark Zuckerberg did. And that's Mark Zuckerberg's parents were going to cushion him and send him to Harvard, which is amazing. And everyone should be so lucky. Right. But my, I went to Cal State Northridge and my little sister went with me to school while yeah. she was in high school. <laughs> we shared a dorm room. So it's like, that was not my reality. No. <laughs> And yeah. it's not the reality of most uh, of most people, especially not most people of color. So we shouldn't we shouldn't apply a model that only works to the very elite in the few because it's well, it's a bad model. And two, we're missing out on opportunities. There's there's probably more promise uh, promise companies that could be out there had had people look beyond that limited scope and model. But I still think it's an important lesson to look. It's not just going out there and just saying you need to go out there and be an entrepreneur. Actually, it is having some experience. There's nothing wrong yeah. with learning in the corporate world or learning in, 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 in from community organizing. All those things can be and are beneficial and have been beneficial to helping you build your company. Because I just hear the lie so much that like you, you, that, that these things don't matter. They really do. That's I just want to say. That. No, it, and, and I also think it's, it's not responsible of us to tell young people or people of color or people who didn't grow up with money to take jobs that pay them in equity. The reality is, is you could only do the risk you can afford to lose. Yep. And if you're the first person in your family who had a job and you have to pay back student loans, the it's like Russian roulette. Like we should be clear, equity is, you're much more likely to fail than succeed. And there are some amazing stories where it works out for people. But, you know, I feel lucky that I think my kids will be able to afford to take risk. I couldn't yep. afford to take risk. Yep. And you know, and so, and I'm conscious that every day I work at Promise, I'm making less money than if I were working somewhere else. So I'm taking risk for my family. And so, but I, I uh, you know, I just think even when I right out of college, I had student loans to pay back. I had to send money home to because my mom, my, you know, like I had to help financially. And the idea that I would have gone somewhere, made twenty thousand dollars, and work for free, like I just, it, it wasn't in my reality. But uh, uh, Phaedra, it's also, it's also a myth. Like it's a total. Google didn't do that. They they were still they were at they were in a college, and the people that started Google were still had their jobs in college. Warby Parker, they didn't do it. They had a Nike, right? Uh, he didn't do it. Like most people, actually have some source of income or some or some type of stability before they go on and make these large uh, these large leaps as company. Jeff Bezos had rich parents that invested three hundred thousand dollars in him. Like he did none of this happen that they just all said they took all the risk in the world and. And they just made. I love to be like, it's just a little money. I was like, three hundred thousand dollars. That's more than my mom's house is worth. It's like, what are you talking about? Twenty five years ago, three hundred thousand. Right, it was at oh, millions wow. of dollars. Right, today, yeah. and I'm yeah. talking twenty twenty one. It's like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh my gosh. So, um, let's see. So you, we talked about fundraising. Um, mm -hmm. And you talked about the system being so corrupt. I, 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 I'm, I'm, and I agree with, obviously. I'm curious, what role do you see in, in, in Promise playing five to 10 years from now in really taking a dent in the criminal justice system to make it less unjust and more, and more just? What do I you think, see in your role and what, what would that look like? So part of what I think we're doing is one is trying to turn systems that are punitive in nature and make them, uh, instead of being punitive, to actually be rooting for people's success. So I think that's one big thing I think that we're doing is we're showing people, it, you don't have to tell someone, you will go to jail if you don't do this. Like that's actually not the best way to run a system. And, um, and so I think that's important. 
And, and uh, I think it's very basic, which is if people have money, we assume we should treat them with kindness and flexibility. And yeah. if people are poor, we should treat them with consequences and, and rigidness. And so the biggest shift I think for promise is that there should be no shame and it's honorable work that people are doing. And the, the idea that there's shame and poverty is unacceptable. And so mm. my hope is that the same privileges we give to people in payments who have money, that that promise will force those same principles of respect and dignity into the system of government and into the, you know, like I want people who to say, why would I pay you interest? Like that's what I'll promise doesn't charge interest. Well, you know, if I need to take six months to pay something off, why would I pay you interest? Right. It's why you, why would we pay the government interest? You know, right. like that's insane. None of our payment plans have interest. And right. the idea that people pay interest to the, you know, like, so shifting people's thinking and, you know, we do something called self self attestation, which is you just say, I qualify, right. Instead of having to provide your taxes. Cause we think people's words matter. And um, people are like, this is so easy. I can't believe this is real. And of, because people aren't being used to treated well right or not, right? It's like human dignity. It's like, yeah. so you can't afford a bill. And so for us, you know, our number went viral because someone was like, you call this number, it was on Facebook and you get free money because we were doing cares. And then you get to pay off your bill as long as you want, which is a, a, a misinterpretation. But we, you know, appreciate it. And, <laughs> but, <they have> <laughs> <for you. laughs> right. but we got all these calls. And it's like, and, hey, you can pay uh, my bills. What up? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh man. That is uh wow. But that, that's, that's, I think a- it's a testament. I was like, I'll say, t- I told the team, I was like, that's as good as it gets. That's yeah. as like, oh, that's the best word of right? mouth. Right. Word of mouth. But then we were like, actually, we're not in that jurisdiction. We got calls and we'd be like, OK, well, do you have a water? This was in where was this at HR in Virginia? And I, we'd be like, OK, well, well, this is do you have a water bill this place? And they were like, no. And I was like, well, we can't do everywhere. <laughs> oh, you know, so anyway. But you moved away just as very quickly. We'll go. But you moved away from bail reform completely, though. We right? did. We did. Yeah, and that's a that's an area because it's 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 I, I think you said this earlier. It's just there's no way that you could have at least with your current application, it wouldn't have helped. It would have probably made it worse. They would have found a way. Let's figure out a way to keep people in jail longer. <laughs> and let's. And I just think that's just so challenging. And so as we listen, people don't understand the severity of how bad our criminal justice system is, how much damage it does to, of course, people, but also to society, how much it costs, how much it costs in lost opportunity. So, uh, you know, thank you for all you're doing to let, highlight the work of people and humanizing people. I just think it's so important couple of, uh, of, of closing out things that we'd like to do, uh, kind of a, a fire round really quick. Um, what's an important conviction or truth you have that many people disagree with you on? This would be a good question for you. Um, what's an important thing? Um, oh, that, um, poor, that uh, people who don't pay their bills are not paying them because they're not able to versus they don't want to. Yep, I figured that. I figured it was going to be something like that because you already said it, but I wanted to. to yeah, you know, people are always like, ah, and I'm always like, like I'm always like, what's your reaction? We, I, one funny conversation I had with someone is, is I was saying we, you should, you know, people should, you should be able to pay in the morning because, and uh, the day you get paid, and the person was like, why does it matter any time of day if you get paid on that day? And I was like, because people's money is gone by the afternoon. And he was like, how could someone's money be gone the day they get paid? And I was like what are you talking about? It's gone before they get paid. When I was growing up, payday was just like the day to pay back what we owed. It wasn't yeah. like- but That's also the problem. Like people that are solving these problems aren't connected and don't have an understanding of what the real experience is. Uh, but to your point, being poor or being rich has nothing to do with your values or the type of person you are. Right. There's a lot of really, really bad people that are rich. There's a lot of great people that are poor, vice versa. The two are not connected to your values and who you are. But we as a society, if we're honest, we see the two as tied together, that if you're poor, then that means there's something wrong with you. It's because you're a bad person. It's because you have bad behavior, so on and so forth. And those things are not true. Uh, but we've been told those lies as a society. All right, so um, you have a billboard, uh, Google ad that, uh, that is your saying or theme for life. What does that say and why? All people deserve to be free. Yeah. And you pretty explain you explained that pretty well already. Uh, all right. You have a committee of three living uh-huh. dead to advise you on business, on life, philosophy, mm-hmm. whatever you want. Tell me who these three people are and why. 
my Nana who passed away, who is like the, uh, uh, you know, like there is one person in life who like, I feel like you're really lucky when someone, I, I heard this once that when someone's eyes light up when they see you. And so for me, the measurement of that, of my grandmother, like I can just measure myself. Is she disappointed? Okay, I got to do it differently. Is she happy? So she would definitely just in, as a human and and I just trust her. And uh, uh, she worked at Macy's and was a member of UFCW. And so just definitely my Nana. Okay. Um, I think, um, the rock Dwayne Johnson, um, he's on my list. I want to meet. he's on my list to meet too. <laughs> I, you know, like it's the thing that's so interesting to me about him is he and Kevin Hart, I watched their discipline. And this yeah. is the one thing I learned being in music is people who are disciplined win. And so, and it does, it's, it's talent plus, but the level of like, just ethos around dedication and discipline. So I'm really, and I'm fascinated that he does it in such a way that is kind. It's not. And I feel like when you and I probably were both in the labor movement where everyone we saw who had power was mean and rough, like power was screaming at people. And so like just learning a different way of being is so aspirational to me. Like, oh, like, you know, I grew up like, which you probably did in the labor movement where it was like people screamed at me and threw yeah. things, you know, like it was like, that was power. You were like made people small. And so how do we figure out different models? And so I'm, I'm really interested um, in, uh, the rock, um, uh, is very, very interesting to me. So, um, I would love to just have his advisement. He's on my list too. That's funny. See, is he? Yeah. So, so just like, and again, they could be living or dead too. So you, you get, right. You get, you get, then I'm trying to think about who else would I want? Um, um, I don't know. I, I gosh, it's like one more. I have to, I don't know. I have we to can end it too. We can end it too. They'll feel no oh, I would too. Because, oh, you know, one where I'm really, yeah. Anyway, so I, there, there's like all these women, like in a group that I'm just trying to get through because I'm really interested in liberation stuff. But, yeah. uh, but yeah, I would probably stay with those two. Oh, anyone who's physically fit. I am increasingly believing that mental health is physical health. And so anyway, I, it, we can have a whole different conversation. So that's why I'm like, oh, is it I, physical? Is it mental? Is it, you know? I think the two are tied together too. Right? I, I make a, a really concerted effort every single morning to get up early, work out. Not, right. not for any reason. Like I want to stay in shape too, but it also helps me not go crazy in the middle. Literally, right? So yeah. To sit in front of a screen all day can also drive your brain crazy. Uh, as you know, I'm sure. Uh, what, one final question. Advice you would give yourself, You were what advice would you give your younger self at any point? Maybe it could be when you started off in entrepreneurship, labor movement, doesn't matter. And what advice would you ignore? Um, I would, I wish I would have known that everything was going to be okay. Because I think when you grow up a certain way, like one, you think you're going to die early. And um, two, I just wish that I had, um, at, like, I just wish I had understood through everything, you know, someone said to me that the light, the, the, someone said to me who was coaching me, they said, the good news is for every dark thing, you've come out with more light. Mm. And I think I didn't understand that. And so I just would be like scared of the dark and each dark moment would overtake instead of seeing it as an opportunity to realize now I know I'm going to come out with light at the end. So mm. even if this is dark, there will be light at the end. So I wish I would have known that because I spent a lot of time just like, oh, shame, worry, you know, like where I should have just been like, it is what it is. And there's something really amazing about as you get older, where now I'm just like, all I can do is show up and be the best I can be. And if people don't like it at a certain point, you just got to go with it. Um, I wish the, um, the part that I would have never listened to is anything that made me try to be something I wasn't and um, tried to make me like contort, like I was a heavy, poor, you know, black woman who went to Cal State Northridge and community college. Like I felt, you know, like everyone would be like, oh, you like, uh, I was talking to someone said, use the words machine learning and you'll, people will really think you're really good. So you show, you know, tech use, uh, you know, like use the AI, use the word AI. Like, I don't know what AI is. I don't use the ML. <laughs> like, it's like, why was it like at this point in my life, why am I going to be like AI, ML? Like I run a software company. We've raised $50 million. I don't know how to use AI. Like it, so on my engineering team, might, but it's like, so I just think that's the wrong life advice advice at this point is you just, you just, you only win by being the best you can be. Amen to that. And to conclude with that, it's a, 
one thing I just learned this week. So uh, a quote from the Bible that talks about humble yourself. So God will exalt you. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. And I've, but there's a different definition of humble in the Hebrew language. It comes from the word, and I might be saying this wrong, Avana, I might be saying the word wrong, but this is what the word, word means to humble oneself from the biblical purpose. It means to take your, uh, your, your God-given space, to occupy your God-given space in the world. That's what it means. Mm. Very different yeah. from what people have thought, uh, have, have said that's what that means, right? So at the end of the day, when you talk about like, yes, you need to do this. And like when people talk about being humble, normally they talk about lowering themselves or moderating. I, no, it's about making sure that you take your place in the world, no more, no less. But you take your place in the world. And as you said, you don't you don't shift or you don't uh, uh, right. change who you are based upon being in that situation. You do. You go in your God given space and move forward. And so you definitely I love like, that. I love because Right. It's like uh, at the end of the day, all we can do is God. Told, OK, God gave us certain skills and we we yep. have to use those. Right. We could either right. like and then be let me be clear. I'm clear. I got to come up. <laughs> it's like, like just clear i know i grew up on food stamps i can assure you like i'm like i'm real clear that i need that's why i was like i can't be stressed i gotta be like just too too blessed to be stressed so yeah uh phaedra ellis lampkins you've been this has been a a, a wonderful conversation I, I, love it. I definitely want to stay in touch yeah absolutely now that you exist i you know like yeah this is awesome so thank you so much